Good evening. Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations. Well, we're pleased to welcome to Conversations this evening for the second time on the series, uh, Carl Dix. And Carl Dix is the national spokesperson for the uh, Revolutionary Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carl, welcome very, very much to Conversations and to New York City. Well, it's actually not a welcome to New York City because I live here even though I've been gone for quite a while. Well, it seems like you've been, I, I know you've been, you've been out in Los Angeles for a long time doing work out there and so forth. But I wonder if maybe we could. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It is sort of welcome back. Okay, welcome, welcome home. back. Welcome <laughs> home, <laughs> okay. uh, Carl. There we go. Uh, but I wonder if you could share with uh, the audience who's viewing, um, let's say maybe weaving it in with your own background a little bit, the, 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 the party itself, when it got started, what, what its involvement is. Uh, your T-shirt says a great deal of what it stands yeah. for, and your hat, which, as I understand, the MLM stands for Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, which says a yeah. great deal. But maybe you could fill us in a little bit on the background of the organization, weaving it into your own background, if you could. Okay. Please. Then we can talk about contemporary events. The Revolutionary today. Communist Party was uh, founded in 1975. Um, I am among the founding members. Our leader at that time and also today is uh, Bob Avakian. He's the chairman of our party. And what the party stands for, we're a party that believes that this whole system that we live under here in this country and around the world is no good. It's based on exploitation. And nothing good can happen for the majority of people in the world until that system is overthrown through revolution. Mm -hmm. Our part in that as a revolutionary party based here in what we call the belly of the beast is to lead people in fighting back against the attacks the powers put down as part of getting ready for doing what's really needed and that's rising up and making revolution right here in unity with our sisters and brothers all over the world who also need to make revolution that's what our party stands for and that's what we work towards i mean where i came into this personally i mean i grew up in the nineteen sixties you know right. i'm from that period and there were a lot of people who were out in the streets taking on the powers, the civil rights movement, struggling against the war in Vietnam. I kind of came at it in an interesting way because I got drafted into the Army in 68 really? uh -huh. and uh, was given orders to Vietnam. Now, uh -huh. I didn't want to go like just about everybody else in the Army. Absolutely. <laughs> Pride Absolutely. Just kept. But at the point I got the orders, I didn't have a political stand on the war in Vietnam one way or the other. It was just a question I didn't want to get ventilated. You weren't particularly, ve you weren't particularly political at that I time? I was not political at that point. But upon getting the orders, I figured I got to decide where I stand in this. Yeah, time. crossing you know, in the road. Am right. I going to go 10,000 miles away in a green uniform with a gun to shoot some people and have them shoot at me and for what? And that was the thing that really kicked off the whole thing for me because I looked into the Vietnam War but at the same time I had to look at what was literally a war going on in the streets of the United States because I came home in uh, <coughs> excuse me November of 69 on leave on the way to Vietnam uh -huh. I'd been home less than a week and Fred Hampton was murdered yeah. in his sleep Fred mm -hmm. Hampton and Mark Clark leaders of the Black Panther Party in Chicago were murdered in their sleep by the Chicago police. Yeah. A couple days later, the LAPD had uh, mortars in the streets of LA attacking the Black Panther Party headquarters. Yeah, absolutely. There was all that co intel, pro yeah. stuff that was going on there. So I had to decide where I stood in this, and I came to the conclusion that I could not go around the world and fight for this country and what they claimed to be fighting for freedom when there was no freedom here, and then looking into what they were doing in Vietnam came to the conclusion that they weren't fighting for freedom, but they were fighting for domination, uh -huh. and that I had to oppose that too. Now, by refusing to go to Vietnam since I was in the Army, Yeah, you were I already up, in. You'd already seen Yeah, that. I ended up in Leavenworth Military Penitentiary uh -huh. for a couple years, and I came out of Leavenworth as a committed revolutionary, Got fighting for education. revolution here, uh -huh. but standing with people fighting for revolution all around the world. Did you get some education in prison? Did oh, you? quite a bit. I yeah, was in solitary for more than half of my time. Good Lord, I'm sorry. What an awful uh, kind of Well, thing nothing to, to be sorry about really? because yeah. the time I spent in solitary had a lot to do with my development as a revolutionary. They just decided that I was such a problem for them that they would never let me out. Now you and I got some yeah. literature down there. We yeah. had some study circles going on and yeah. a few people came out of that as committed revolutionaries. Right, so. yeah. 
little bit like, well, Malcolm got educated when he was in yeah. prison, too. We're going to yeah. talk a little bit about Malcolm yeah. a little bit later. But, you know, there were, there were all these things going on. And I don't mean to be personal. It's none of my business and so forth, that sort of thing. You, because you obviously become a very much of a committed, politically-minded person and so forth. Uh, these things were going on. Where were you at? Before uh, 1968, 69, were you well, in Rock and Roll? No, I was involved in Maryland. What were you, you know, or... You I was were, in... It was all, because all these things yeah, were going no, on. No, you're right. feisty time. What were you thinking about when you were an early teenager and things, you know? I mean, what I was mainly thinking about was myself. Yeah. You know, okay, I was yeah. trying to get a job. I right. was buying a car, you know. Get a Corvette if you could. No, I couldn't get a Corvette. Yeah. I was lucky to get something with four <laughs> wheels. I yeah. think I had a... Yeah. yeah. What was it, a Ford Falcon? You were out of Baltimore. Baltimore right? Yeah, I was out yeah. of Baltimore, Maryland, right. you know, yeah. and I was just trying to make it, you know. Yeah. I, was trying, I was going to school at night. I yeah. was going to make something out of myself. Yeah. And then I end up in the Army, faced with these orders, and it, that's what helped me to see that I wasn't just an isolated individual out here yeah. on my own, but that there was a whole society and there were whole groups of people that were in the same situation that I was. And, yeah. You know, you get down to, uh, we t they took us to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I guess half of the people they took down there were blacks who were going into well, the Bragg Army. Fort was, Bragg was, was airborne, wasn't it? Uh, no. No, no, okay. They okay. had a big basic training set up then, and when you enter the uh, base at Fort Bragg, there's a, there was a big billboard at that time that was put up by the Ku Klux Klan. Good grief. And it says, welcome to Klan country. I'll be damned. Ku Klux Klan of America. Yeah. And they were just, yeah. and they got the billboard to make real clear to you where you were. Yeah. And then once you got on the base, you realized that like, yeah, this is where I am because that's the kind of treatment you got. And I had been asleep politically up to that point, but uh, the U.S. Army and the Klansmen outside the Army and in the Army slapped me awake. Yeah, I didn't. I don't want you to press on this, and we got a lot of things to talk about. But that point in the road, in a certain sense, when you made a decision, you must have been a young man, 18, 19, 20, or 21, something like that, when you got that call. And rather than not go in, you actually did go into the army. You, you actually were. You, you you accepted the draft into the yeah, army. Yeah, I accepted the you draft. You didn't make the decision before that to not do it. You got into the army, and yeah. then. Something happened that made you change your mind? When well, you were in the army, or when did you come to the point where you had to make that? Why? In the it was when I got really the orders to Vietnam, and I had to decide: was I down with the war so in if Vietnam? You, if, you, if you'd been and in the could military, I be down with what this bigger. country was doing I here to black people here right. and others? Right. And if you had, if you had, uh, if you had uh, not been ordered off to Vietnam, you might have just, and you'd been able to get duty in the Caribbean. Yeah, I may have, you may have been continued able to, to sleepwalk. To sleepwalk but then on the other hand, yeah. maybe the system would have slapped me a little bit later. Yeah. I mean, but that was, was the were, thing. Mm -hmm. Because when I got the draft notice, yeah. it was very inconvenient. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I did not want to put on a green uniform, get my hair shaved off, and, you know, go and deal with all that mess. I know. But that's all it was. It was yeah. really inconvenient. Yeah. The question of the Vietnam War was also very inconvenient, but more than that, I decided that I could not, you know, in, good, in conscience, stand with and be a part of what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam. And I couldn't do it even if, and they did make these offers that, well, just go over there and we'll see to it that you won't be in the middle of the mess. Yeah. I mean, one is I found out from people that you shouldn't believe what the U.S. Army tells you. <laughs> well, that is <laughs> Because a, they told a lot of people that, and then they found themselves off on the front line. Yeah, it was a horror. But two, even if they were going to set me up so that I wasn't going to be a part of the mess, yeah. if I had the uniform on, carried the weapon, and went over there, I was a part of the mess. Yeah, right. So I couldn't deal with it on those terms. I uh hear. -huh. Uh -huh. And that was a pretty important stand, I think, for me to take. It would have been, it, because you're in their clutches. And yeah. it's hard when you're in the Army. It ain't easy, you know. To well, but I up. also didn't yeah. do it alone. I mean, there were yeah. six of us who refused to go to Vietnam together. We were called the Fort Lewis Six. Uh -huh. And there were actually a lot of GIs at that point who rebelled, some of them even in Vietnam, who yeah. refused to go out and fight, different things like that, because yeah. the 60s was that kind of period. Yeah. One question that comes up a lot from people, though, is, okay, that was the 60s. Yeah. And... All right, you did some stuff back then, but a lot of people did stuff back then. Yeah, there why was a are lot you, of ferment, yeah. yeah. Why are you still out here now? Yeah. And see, what I really got to say to that is two things. One is, I became a revolutionary back in the late 60s, early 70s, because there were some situations out there that I think revolution addressed, that revolution was what was needed to solve them. And that was the fact that 
the U.S. went around the world and oppressed and brutalized, you know, peoples in various parts of the world. And at mm -hmm. the same time, what the U.S. was doing within the borders of the country, the way it was, which it was coming down on black people, yeah, on yeah. Latinos, on the native population, on women. See, and all those were things that I felt I had to deal with then. You look at the world today, the United States is still going around the world brutalizing, oppressing, and ripping off people all around the I world. I saw a speech by President The oppression Carter. of black people yeah, right. is still out there, the way in which the system dogs and degrades women. All of that stuff that I decided I had to deal with in the 60s is still out there. Yeah, the yeah. job ain't finished, yeah. so I don't feel like I can quit. Oh, but the other part, and which is a very important part, is that I never lost my hope in a revolutionary solution to the problems that we face. And what's real important in that is the Revolutionary Communist Party and the fact that it has a philosophy and a strategy and a plan for preparing for getting ready for revolution right here in the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these letters I got on my cap, MLM, that's Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, that's our philosophy, that's our approach on it, that's what we try to base ourselves on, and it allows us both to understand how to fight these powers today to get into the best position to be able to lead people when the time comes, and it could come sooner than anyone might think, mm. to rise up and get rid of this system through revolution. And it also allows us to see how we can learn from the revolutions that have gone on in other parts of the world that got turned back, like in the Soviet Union and China, mm. where for a while the working class held power, but that power has been ripped from them, yeah. from their hands by uh, capitalist rotors. So we never lost our faith Capitalist what? Capitalist rotors. We can get rotors? into yeah people within who call themselves communist and socialist, but actually take the country on a capitalist path. Mm -hmm. We think mm -hmm. that that happened in the Soviet Union with uh, the rise of Khrushchev, and it happened in China with uh, Hua Guofeng, Deng Xiaoping. Yeah, it sure seemed people the Soviet coming to power. Yeah, it sure seemed the Soviet Union had a state capitalism there in a certain sense, with a Politburo run, apparatchik yeah. run, no, uh, that's what elite you group that. These, these, these world, the, the countries of the world seem to get in a small elite group and the masses of the people all over the world suffer. I was just saying earlier, I saw a speech the other day by Mr. Carter, ex-President Carter. Amazing speech he gave at Stetson University. And he, it was a, they asked him on ethics. He said, what's the major ethic question in the world? And he said, and he said it with what was undisguised feeling or it was of the moment, you know what I mean? It wasn't uh, re seemingly rehearsed. And he said, it's the gap that we allowed there to be between the poor people and the rich people in this world. And then he went on to say, the United States is, I'm not sure he said warmongering, but almost to that degree, a warmongering country. It's a way for a, country, a president to become popular is to attack another country. And he condemned uh, the invasion of Nicaragua, where we, I mean of Panama, where we killed thousands. Granada, the bombing of Libya, the tacit agreement to the bombing in, in uh, you know, around Lebanon and the things that we've done. He said, we're a war-making country, this country. It was amazing talk for an ex-president and a trilateralist. Yeah, and there have been also <laughs> many other people who have, even in this last election that we just had in 1992, who we were talking, you know, before we started running the camera here, there were so many people who expressed to even a conservative uh, pollster like Richard Wortham, a Republican, you know, that they felt fundamentally alienated from this system and they felt that this system did not serve them well and that this system served a small ruling elite who, run, who ran the country and they felt politically locked out of the system as it's, as it's going. There might be more people who share that long-term view that you have and it's been, you know, it hasn't been outered so directly in their mind, but you've held that view for a long time. But there might be more sympathy among more members of the general society than people might think. Well, we've always felt that there was a fine basis in the situation, even in this country, for our views to galvanize a section of people you know, who really want to see that kind of solution and to rally to our side even broader numbers of people who may not be under, as under the gun as some other people are, but who got problems with the way the setup's going. And uh, well, we'll probably talk about this too. I've been doing some national media recently and a yeah. reporter from the Washington Post talked to me about how dismal it must be being a revolutionary in the midst of the United States. And I said, no, this is, to me, this is the best time to be alive and being a revolutionary. Because when you look at it, this system is in deep trouble. I mean, and 
from our analysis, we were not bothered when the Soviet Union went down the tubes mm -hmm. and all like that because we stood with Miles' assessment of the Soviet Union that it represented not real communism but phony communism, state capitalism, that it went around the world and oppressed people just like the United States. So for us, the demise of the Soviet Union represented one of the big exploiters of people around the world going down the tubes. And at the same time, what really heartened us is that this other big exploiter of the people, the bigger one, the United States, is also in deep trouble. When you look at their economic situation and what they talk about in terms of a solution, they don't really have one. What they've got is they've got illusions and crumbs for better off sections of people and really very vicious attacks for the people on the bottom. And we think that that kind of situation, far from cooling people out and intimidating them into being passive, what you're going to see is you're going to see more mass explosions like happened in Los Angeles, yeah. you know, this past spring. And we think that that was very important because in the flames of LA, we saw the potential for the people on the bottom of society, the propertyless proletarians of all nationalities, to unite their ranks and rise up and rally to their side broader numbers of people. So we saw the potential for a future proletarian revolution right here in the belly of the beast. And that tremendously heartens us. Another very heartening factor for us is the development of the revolution in Peru. And while there are, there is a very important and critical situation that I think we should talk about, and that is the a couple months ago, the capture of the yeah. leader of that revolution. One thing about that revolution is that it shows the future being made and being made by working people, being made by people who till the soil with their hands, people who sweat all day in uh, you know, somebody's sweatshop, making someone else rich and probably some capitalists from the United States or Europe rich with their labor. Well, a lot of those people have risen up in revolution have carried that revolution on and sustained it for 12 years in the face of everything that the government backed up by the Yankee imperialist in Washington, D.C. could throw at them and spread it throughout the country and made it real clear that their revolution is not one geared towards getting a few leaders to sit down at the table and play let's make a deal mm -hmm. with the reactionaries and their imperialist backers, but aimed at sweeping away the oppressive structure that's held down the Peruvian people. And that's been a very important example to people all over the world. Yeah, that was Mr. Guzman or Gonzalo, they called yeah. him, right? He was taken and he's under arrest now and so forth by Fujimora's government in, in Peru. And there was a great deal of, has been in the press and uh, one wants to make sure Amnesty International and a whole lot of other groups uh, keep uh, tabs on what, what happens uh, to, to him and, you know, and that sort of, that, 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 that sort of thing. Um, you know, I wondered if uh, you're wearing Mao Zedong on your yeah. on your chest, you know, uh, and so like forth. Like to make it clear where I'm coming from. Yes, <laughs> right, right. Now there have been changes. Uh, another, we at one time we would have said that more than half of the world's population may have been adherents before the downfall, as it were, and the events in Europe and in mm -hmm. and Soviet Union. Uh, that uh, better than half of the world's population had been following or had been involved in governments which were basically or had been based upon Marxian thinking. Uh, Marx had a great influence there. Now, that seems to be whether it will come back again in the Soviet Union is something that some people wonder. But um, what about China? Uh, the developments that, have de uh, that uh, came along in China and the developments, the way things are moving in China, how do you feel about China and the, the current regime in China and what's going on there and some yeah. of the Compradora kinds of things and things that are going well, on. Well, we, think, you, that the, you feeling about we think that the current regime in China is state capitalist just like the Soviet Union used to be. Mm -hmm. That with the death of Mao and the arrest of his widow mm -hmm. and the people who work closely with him, the so-called Gang of Four and the purging yeah. of the leadership of the party there, that what happened was the very capitalist rotors that Mao Zedong fought against all his life seized control of the party and then used the institutional role that the Communist Party had played to turn the society around and lead it back down the capitalist path. So it did not surprise us at all when Deng Xiaoping mm -hmm. came to the White House to uh, receive the honors, you know, and yeah. meet up with the president when uh, corporation, U.S. and European corp and Japanese corporation after corporation began to 
set up deals with the Chinese government to exploit the Chinese people. Because basically, what you had was you had a grouping of people who linked in with the revolution not to sweep away all exploitation and oppression once and for all, which is the real goal of a communist-led revolution, but people who linked up with the revolution because they saw it as the only way to build a modern, powerful state with themselves in positions of power. Uh -huh. Once they got to positions of power, then they wanted to stop the revolution. People like Mao said, no, the goal of the revolution is not to put me in charge, but to get to the point where there's no longer anybody in charge. I think he used to, say, uh, used to have, a, you need a revolution every 10 years or something yeah, that's in order what he to shake up the bureaucracy in that's the established said, orders, because yeah. the human nature tends to be, power will tend to consolidate in those if they have a chance to do that. And it, it's operative that way around the world. The world is a, a, on a world scale, no matter which of the state systems we look at. Um, I don't know, the trilateral nations uh, probably 20 years ago made up about 60% <coughs> of world gross national product. They make up about 60% of that now, uh, sort of stayed the same. And they, they have, you were speaking earlier about the, the, the working peoples and so forth. In the, in the United States and in virtually all of the economies of the world, they're, they're, they're operating economic plutocracies. A relatively small group of people own the means, what Marx, I guess, would have called the means of production, the technological wealth as opposed to income. I mean, the capital mm -hmm. instruments that make wealth are owned by relatively few people. And in fact, in the United States, it could be as many as few as five, maybe five percent effectively own virtually all of the capital instruments that are the technological instruments that are increasingly responsible for technology, 10 percent certainly. And the vast majority of the people are essentially dependent upon wages. That yeah, they own nothing that but their ability to do some work. Their labor. To make they're, somebody they're workers, else rich, right? yeah. And they, they own none of the means of production, really. Their wage, uh, I guess in the rhetoric of you know, it would be wage slavery or wage earners, yeah. and so some are well paid, and then they have people under them and so forth. But it's a sort of hierarchical system of wage trickle-down slavery is the system that goes in all of the world. You're, you, you would not want to see, in the name of revolution, a surcease of the technological advancement and the ability to bring technological benefit to the world society. And if there are some benefits that have been realized through time, we do want to keep the spark of the, or we do want to keep the technological advancement of humanity moving, do we not? I yeah. mean, in order to try and bring life support to the masses? Yeah, but the key thing is to liberate the people. Yeah. You know, and if you can do that, you can actually accomplish miracles, including on the technological front. I mean, some instances of things that went down in China when it was a revolutionary country, they required large ships to transport you know some of the food that was being grown in some parts of the country where the agriculture was good to other parts you know through the river system and no capitalist country would sell them those ships you know with, mm. with, without you know attaching very stiff conditions to them and the chinese workers were told they couldn't build them because they didn't have the technology to do it the workers actually studied the question and studied Mao Zedong's little red book and devised methods for building ships twice as large as the Western experts told them was possible with the technology and the docks that they had. And they did that because the workers themselves were able to master the situation and decided this is what we need and we have to conquer this. See, and that's what we can do. We can do, we can, you know, you look around the world, you got people starving in large parts of Africa it's and Asia. You got people in Eastern Europe lining up and massacring each other, causing starvation and all kinds of stuff like that, when it is possible now to produce everything that people need. You yeah, know, people's the, needs can be met, yeah, yeah. except that you've got this capitalist free market system that puts a stranglehold on not only the means to create wealth, but the direction in which those means get employed. So instead of producing and distributing the food to the areas of the world that require it to end starvation, you get food produced and even destroyed in some of the wealthier, because it's still a question, the case here that they destroy 
food in order to keep the price up. Well, what do you say to those who say, well, they tried, they tried, they tried to do away with private property as opposed to governmental intervention in, let's just say the Soviet Union is one example of a so-called socialist system. It got taken over by a class. But they, they say the institution of private property, that the wealth, uh, the wealth producing technology is able to be owned by individuals who realize uh, profit and benefit mm -hmm. by that. And it's that principle of private property ownership that is at the problem. And we must do away with that. But yet it is that system that has created so much of the technology, airplanes, mass communication, so many of the uh, expressions of technology that through the human expression has made it so that we, are, we have this technologically augmented capability of providing for everybody in the world. Do, do, do you understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand and what And when you're they raising. took away that, it, it, with no market principles for distributing it or something of that sort, it seemed, it seemed not to, to work except for a very, very large project. Without the market, it didn't seem to work as a way of distributing the capability that the, the, this, the, the technologically augmented systems created. Okay, well, first I mean, off... Would you do away with the institution of private property so there could be no individual ownership of the means of production? Or is it possible to expand the ownership of the means of production to everybody so that there, everybody could have some ownership of the technology rather than it being concentrated in so well, few what, hands. But to keep that, 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 that system of production going, because if the system of production were to fall apart that exists in the modern world, we would have anarchistic chaos and disaster in the world. Wouldn't okay. we? Or how do you address that? Well, First off, I'd say that the system of production that we have in the world today is responsible for the problems that we got in the world. But it's also people responsible are not, for the... People for are the not starving in Africa by accident. Okay. I mean, Africa at one point could produce far more food than the Africans could eat. Mm -hmm. And that was prior to the, the advent of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Now you got a situation where people there are, ma are starving in horrendous numbers, and that's a direct result of capitalism and imperialism. So when people want to make the argument for, you know, how fine the system of production is, they got to speak to mass starvation in the Sudan. They got to speak to mass starvation in Mozambique and many other places because that's also the legacy of the free market system. They can't just say it works pretty good in Europe because what helps to make it work pretty good in Europe is the tremendous deprivation of people all around the world. And it don't work that good in Europe either or America either, so let's talk about that. The other thing, though, is that I don't think that the only way that you can motivate people to produce is based on the uh, principle of private property and private ownership. I think we got to look again at a situation like China when it was a revolutionary country, or even the Soviet Union when it was a revolutionary country. They actually accomplished quite a bit at industrializing the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was a very backward country sure, when yeah. the revolution happened. Yeah. And it actually was built up to the point where uh, during World War II it took on the brunt of the German Absolutely, military machine no doubt about it. Stalin and played the yeah. key role in defeating it. Now we yeah. think there were some mistakes in how they went about it because they didn't understand the relationship between the need to develop the agricultural and small industry sector to support the heavy industry sector. But that's that a was, big if. And that was a problem. But then you look at the situation in China, because Mao was able to look at the experience of Stalin and to sum up some things from that. And he developed his point about, well, he called it playing the piano, mm -hmm. that if you want heavy industry, you got to have light industry, and you got to have agriculture. And that's one thing they fought for in China. And China was a very poor country, Absolutely. which also was beset by mass starvation sure, sure. prior to the revolution. Yeah, it was still poor yeah. after the revolution yeah. because you can't remake society overnight. Yeah. But it was a poor country in which nobody was starving. And you could go next door to India, which was almost as large population-wise as China and yeah. face some of the same problems as China. Yeah. And, uh, Starvation continued to happen widely throughout India because the people in India did not hold power in their hands. They couldn't direct 
the production and distribution of society in such a way that it could meet their needs collectively. And I think people can do that because I wanted to get back to another yeah, point you raised. Yeah, in real trouble now. And yeah. that's the human nature point. Yeah. Because I don't think that humanity has an unchanging nature. Uh -huh. You okay. know, I mean, right. at one point, if you looked at society, people would say that it would be natural for there to be kings who had the divine right to rule. Well, people don't say that no more. Yeah. At one point, people would say that someone who looked like you had the right to own someone who looked like me. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. that slavery yeah, right. was the natural order of yeah, things. things yeah. And the thing was, at that point, that was the way in which things were produced, and that's why there were people justifying it politically and philosophically. Right. Well, nobody, well, most people don't justify that anymore. There probably are still a few people yeah, who would want to make that argument. Yeah, yeah. You know, but people would view them as largely relics of, you know, a, a, a long age. time it's past. And on, see, right, what right. we think is that the reason that people today do act in a look out for number one, I'm going to get mine, kind of way is because they live in a society that's organized based on those principles. I mean, the entire society is based on, we, I call it the organized robbery of the working class. And in that kind of situation, what comes forward to people as the way to get ahead is to get out from under that organized robbery and get themselves on top where they can be the ones raking it in off of somebody else's labor. We think that upon making revolution and getting beyond this dog-eat-dog -dog society, that we'll be able to bring forward new kinds of qualities in human beings that people can actually sacrifice for the common good. We're not just bringing that down out of the sky. That's something that actually happens under this setup. I mean, I look back in the 1960s, back when I was politically asleep, there were mm -hmm. people who were going down south, you know, being having dogs sicked on them, yeah. sheriffs clubbing them, even mm -hmm. people being murdered. And I'm not just talking about black people, although it was mostly black people, there were whites. Yeah. who went down south to stand yeah, with remember, that. Remember, and when yeah. they did that, yeah. they weren't doing it for some kind of personal gain. Yeah. What they were seeing was that there was massive injustice in society, and they felt they had to do something. They had to sacrifice, some of them even putting their lives on the line uh -huh. in order to change things. And we think that people who can do that in the midst of a dog-eat-dog -dog setup are pointing to the potential for humanity to develop new kinds of qualities, bring forward qualities that are within and p potentially within people yeah. if we can get outside of a society and a social system that sets it up, you know, for whites to dominate people of color, that sets it up for men to suppress women. We think that if we can break beyond the society that organizes itself on that basis, that we can bring forward men who don't look at themselves like dominators of women or white people who don't view themselves as superior to other people because of the color of their skin. Yeah. We think we can change all that. Right, right, right. Because, it, you know, it is, we live in a time, you know, 200,000 years ago when first we, we, we emerged out of uh, things, they, they had, uh, no, 15, 15 billion years ago with the Big Bang. They got a photograph now that shows <laughs> the beginning of the universe as we know it, mm -hmm. so, uh, two or 300,000 years after the beginning of the Big Bang of the universe. Homo sapiens sapiens, apparently from the mitochondria of DNA studies, show that we all evolved from one person out of Africa. We're all from Africa. All 5.5 billion human beings are descended of a single person, right? There's that thing. We've been around 200,000 years, and we get to the point where maybe within the lifetime of my son, the near term lifetime of my son, we finally cross that uh, Promethean line where we have enough of this destructive technological capability that is outer consciousness in a certain sense, technology that we've built with thermonuclear weapons and binary bacteriological weapons and all these things that have been built as these power, people have struggled for power, to where we can destroy the species for the first time. Couldn't do it in the Second World War. Didn't have enough power. We were impotent in terms of wiping ourselves out as a species. We have that. The averse side of that is the, but it is the technology which is, the human nature or human brain or the human capability hasn't changed that much in that period of time as human beings. What's changed is the technology. It's the extension of our, tech, of our brain and our technological capability which has changed through, through that time. And the averse side of that destructive scenario, which many worlds in the universe, there must be many, many by probability theory, many universe, worlds in the universe which have evolved intelligent life. And they reach the point, Monsieur Kako makes that point. They reach the point, they reach, they discover U92, and they can't transit what Fritzhoff Kapra calls that turning point of being able to move from a 
fundamental scarcity kind of situation into a technologically augmented reality of there being sufficiency, that there's being enough for people so that you don't have to have one group suffer in order for another group to benefit. That might be the adverse side of the destructive scenario that we have now. But if there is something that has signaled this progress, if it has been progress, bringing us to this perhaps birth of the capability of there being some sort of elemental justice for all the people on this world, it's been the technology. And the question is, how is that technology best going to be able to be utilized in order to bring that? If, if, if we do away with, if, if we say there's some people who own it all, and then the, the rest of us are all workers, and if we all say we're only workers, and then we're going to do away with the ability of anybody to own any of it, to realize any of what the technology can realize, we're setting ourselves up for a situation. Well, what, 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 what do we mean when we say revolution? Wouldn't, isn't there something to be said for the fact that, that instead of it just being a few people owning a robot that can turn out tremendous technological capability, everybody should own a piece of that and get an income of that rather than perpetually saying we're only workers. As long as the technology is increasingly responsible for the production, and if we're only going to put our worker labor power into that equation and never ask to have any ownership of the technology, who's going to own the robots and the cybernetic systems that are going to be increasingly responsible for mass-produced uh, material goods in a, in a society, if you understand what I mean? That's yeah, what, I understand I don't what quite you mean. understand where, that, where Marx where Marx missed that in a certain sense. Well, I don't think did. that Marx missed it. I think Marx's point was that the next step, once you reach this point of a few people owning this ability to create tremendous amounts, enough to meet everyone's needs and to deal with everybody's necessities. Yeah, but that's the not fact, recognized by the political But the leadership. fact yeah. that a yeah. few people own it yeah. is exactly the reason that it doesn't meet everybody's needs, but in fact it goes to benefit these handful of owners. Well, would and what's you, required would you, then is that the mass of people who have got to labor to create all this wealth well, you still think should themselves not only labor in common to create the wealth, but should own the wealth that's produced in common and the means to create it. And but see, once you achieve that, then the direction in which the technology is unleashed to create things also gets transformed. But you, I mean, you, today, you subscribe to the surplus value of labor theory, that the technology, uh, that technologies can yield labor, and that everything's been created by labor, yeah. and that technology has no intrinsic value in and of itself as a productive uh, part of the productive element, and that it has no return. The technology, it, 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 do you understand what I'm saying? Is uh, the technology mm -hmm. unleashes our ability to create much more, so it, inter it impacts back on the process, but the technology's existence stems from the application of labor to nature. Well, it's an extension it's, of our technology. And it's related to the accumulated but experience it, that we got, but that isn't... Sara, Lee, Sara Lee runs their thing, and they turn out all <laughs> these biscuits and things like that, right? Or there's, yeah, a, okay. there's a computer making right. place in <laughs> Japan, and the thing is run as robots. It's all robots. There's about six people running it there. There's increasing numbers of that. Robotics, and there's a robot doing that in microprocessing. The microprocessing uh, revolution is coming, is, is, is coming out of Japan, and it's coming out of Silicon Valley, and the Tiger States, and to some degree Europe, and so forth. And these technologies are producing wealth. Well, right? Yeah, but see, it's not, it's not labor. At the base and, of, I mean, why don't we take some of that technological well, capability and extend ownership of that to the masses, so that instead of saying they're only workers and stressing the working input to that, which is less and less relevant in terms of total input to overall production, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, see, I understand I mean, what you're saying, and one, it ain't going to work because the people who own it ain't going to give it up. You know, they actually benefit from owning it, and they're going to maintain those benefits at all costs. I mean, because we look at what they did in Vietnam, and what they did in Vietnam it was a horror. Was a horror, but it yeah. was a horror pointed at something at maintaining U.S. domination not only of Vietnam, but 
They saw Vietnam as a very bad example for other places around the world that they dominate, and they ain't backed up off of that one bit. Well, it was George Kennedy I mean, containment, you even and they had this idea of containing the land-based communist menace that was coming out of central, you know, out of there, and they had this historical context that they saw things in, and the, the, the thing yeah, that they were see, against was true. communism. But they also and the, saw... And the institution they were going to try and protect was private property. Yeah, and they also saw that if they gave up on that goal in Vietnam, it would send a very bad message to the rest of the world that they dominated. So they tried to drown the Vietnamese Revolution in blood on that basis. And see, they ain't changed. They will take that stand. They're not going to, you know, give it up. And that's why it's a question of if you're going to take the power to determine the lives of countless millions of people around the world and here in this country from the hands of these handful of bloodsuckers, it's going to take a revolution. The other thing is, I mean, well, what would the revo what, when you say revolution, what do the you, revolution you mean would revolution, do? Like if somebody uh, is uh, got a gun or something. Yeah. Or what do you mean? That's a what revolution is. Revolution is an armed uprising. Yeah. Proletarian revolution is armed uprising of the people on the bottom of society. In a country like this, it would take the form of armed uprisings in the major population centers. The successful ones of those uprisings, people would have to move forward to link them up to form the basis for a revolutionary regime and to carry out a civil war to defeat the power's military force once and for all. And the goal of that revolution would be to put the people who rose up and made the revolution in power, in, power, in the position of administering the society. So they would take over the power rather than the trilateralists. You'd have another group yeah. of power who well, would rule over all the but people. But here's the difference. And they would say, but we're here's in the, the name of the people. We're talking about a revolution based on millions of people rising up all across the country here and those people not rising up in order to put the revolutionary communist party and Carl Dix and Baba Bacon in charge and then to go back home but those people themselves becoming part of the new institutions of revolutionary power that that's what it's got to be it's got to be a question of the revolutionary people themselves becoming the new institutions of revolutionary power that's the kind of government that we'd want to set up and in terms of going towards that yeah here's your paper yeah yeah. Oh, yeah sure no but i, I want to make a point we come up with this paper every week the reason we do this is yeah, because we want people it's so revolutionary got, worker so newspaper can you come in on this type maybe hello camera one hello could you come in on this type let me show the people you know we this put this the paper, paper out. out every week and the kind of things it's dealing with in this issue are what it always deals with you know yeah let's hold it long enough so that they can get a fix on it. which one are you coming you coming in tight on yeah. one? You know, a lead article on the crisis in Peru, the role of uh, U.S. intervention in the revolution there, and the role of the United Let's States in the yeah. drug trade in Peru. Yeah. It's also got uh, some of our continuing coverage on the movie Malcolm X. Um, right, and it's called The Revolutionary Worker, right? Yeah, The Revolutionary Worker newspaper. Yeah, and we thing. take up questions like this in this country and around the world every week yeah. because we don't want a bunch of blind followers. Mm -hmm. Can't make a, the kind of revolution we're talking about that way. What we need is people on the bottom of society and middle class people who can analyze all these situations and understand exactly what's involved, what the stakes are, both for oppressed people here and around the world, but also for the uh, imperialists who are dominating over us. That's the only way that we're going to be in position to make the kind of revolution that we're talking about. One, because we're going to need a lot of leaders to make the revolution, but even more important than that, once the revolution is made, we've got to have conscious, active people, millions of them, who can administer the new society, who can unleash the masses of people to take up questions like, okay, what should be produced and how? And, and you, how does and that if fit you made in? That revolu if we were to make that revolution yeah. in that sense, where the whole system is, the whole thing is overthrown and everything like that, we would do away with the market system. You would do away with, uh, you know, like the market system of distribution of goods and services. And yeah, so we would do away with the How way in which things? things are distributed now. Yeah. What it would be based on is would be based It'd on be people. It'd be a mess for a while. People consciously decide. Well, it's a mess right now. Well, all right. I mean, it is. Yeah. I just it's came true. back from Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah. It's a mess out there. Yeah. You know, and we can talk about that too. Yeah. You know, but this would be a revolutionary mess, and it would be a lot of confusion. Mao said, hey, w when he made the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, he said it was confusion on a grand scale, and he took full responsibility because out of that confusion, the aim was to bring the people more to the point of realizing 
holding the power in their hands to determine all of society. And it would be a thing of people deciding, you know, say in an agricultural area of California, what they should produce, not only for their own needs, but for the needs of people in other parts of the country or even other parts of the world, uh -huh. you know, and how that fit in with, you know, what else was going on. And it would no longer be a question of, say, some capitalist somewhere figuring out what would bring back the largest profit, but what was the best way to meet the needs of people here and around the world. But that didn't work, seemingly. Like in well, the Soviet Union, it didn't work. I mean, it uh, was overthrown. It's not Eastern that it didn't Europe, work. It was the overthrown. The people in Eastern Europe are all saying we want to have some way of having. They, it didn't provide. The, okay. The, well, no. The, let's the, let's the, talk about what it did. Yeah. See, Eastern Europe first. We got to separate that off because we don't think Eastern Europe was ever really socialist. What we think happened in well, Eastern Europe. Well, by your Europe, terms, given given the fact that so many people have compromised and so forth and everything, no. there what are very happened, few examples. That what we happened go in to. Eastern Europe yeah. was that when the Red Army drove out the Nazis, yeah. then regimes were put in place that did not represent people rising up to transform things, but people being placed in positions of power by the victorious Red Army, and that don't make you socialist. Mm. In the Soviet Union, that kind of revolution did go down and transformation did take place up to the period of uh, Khrushchev when they reinstituted the profit motive and they were very frank about it we're bringing back the profit motive as the way to direct the society and basically there were mistakes made in the Soviet Union but it is not the case that it didn't work in fact it worked well enough for the uh, Soviet Union to take on and defeat the brunt of yeah, German they did military a lot of infrastructure might and, they up and to stand up to the United States in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. What happened is it was overthrown and that's also what happened in China mm -hmm. and it was overthrown based upon conflict within the Communist Party which was playing the leading role in developing the revolutionary society and what Mao pointed out is that there would be people within the Communist Party itself whose take on the revolution was not to continue advancing it forward, to continue to get rid of exploitation and oppression in the revolutionary society and all around the world, but to feather their own nest, to buttress up their own power. That's the, kind, that's the role that Khrushchev played when he led a capitalist coup inside the Soviet party and the role that Deng Xiaoping and Hua Guafeng played in China. Yeah. So what happened was proletarian revolution didn't fail, it was overthrown. Well, proletarian then, like, um, what, what, if I may, and I appreciate this, okay. and proletarian is a term for the, the working class. The working class, the propertyless people, the people who ain't got well, nothing. Well, the propertyless, yeah. that represents about 95% of the people in the United States. Uh, about 5% of the population owns currently, uh, all, probably about 5% owns virtually almost 100% yeah of the That's capital true. assets. There, is all, there also is a middle class that I would say is Who not... get trickle-down wages. Yeah. They're working class. Well, They're all working because they don't own the wealth. The people who no, own the wealth... No, we think it's important to make some distinctions right, there. Yeah. But see, this isn't the... I guess I don't mainly want to get into a, this kind of... Oh, okay. I'm a sorry. breakdown of stuff. I mean, if yeah. it, it is your show, though. So. Well, no, no, I'm just curious about that. Yeah. But, I mean, it, so, so, so you have these few people who own the wealth, what, what's going to happen to the, the means of, I'm wondering about the means of production. The, the means of production means is going to become production. the common property of the government. all of society. It will become the government. Of all of society, and that would be administered in the transition period of society by the revolutionary government. But it would be a different kind of government. It would be a government based on the conscious activism of the people who rose up and made revolution. It ain't going to be a question How that every four years people are going to get to, you know, vote for this or that representative of their oppressors the way that it goes down now. I mean, and that's how your do you, involvement how do you, now. How do you keep now a small a group thing. from just taking over? If you, if you, if you, your if only you, guarantee on that is... If, if, you ha if you have all of the wealth, the political power of the state, plus all of the ownership of the technology in the hands of a revolutionary group of leaders who take over the country and it's all in their hands, how in the world are you going to keep all the power from being in the hands of a small group of people who lead a revolution? Okay. It goes back to... If you don't even have a private sector, uh, well, you know, to try to counterbalance the political power of the governing element. Okay, well, first off, that ain't how it goes down now. The private sector 
is represented by the government element. To a large degree. Yeah. That, that's in fact the political arm of these owners of the wealth and the yeah. means to create wealth. But it goes back to the point I was making when I talked about the importance of the Revolutionary Worker newspaper and the kind of questions that it Yeah, right, right, right. The only thing that you got is you got the science of revolution, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and the fact that there are millions of people that, well, we're struggling with people right now to become conscious revolutionaries, not to become blind followers, like I said. Yeah. And it's those kind of people, people on the bottom of society, and even people who, frankly, ain't all that educated in book learning and all like that, well, we got to educate them in terms of their interest as a propertyless class of people and how not only our preparations for revolution have got to be carried out, you know, fighting back against the powers on whatever front they're coming down on people, but also where the revolutionary, what the goals of the revolution are, so that when leading people, and we don't care who those leading people are, if they start taking things in a direction away from the goals of revolution, if they start trying to buttress their own positions of power, feather their own nest, that we have brought forward and trained a generation and more of people in the goals of the revolution and its principles so that they can call those out and struggle against those people taking power. Now a lot of people say this kind of thing ain't possible but again I think we gotta look to Peru and I think there are a couple things I wanna say. There's a video called The People of the Shining Path yeah. and it's based on a uh, TV report that uh, a crew from England did in Peru and it really blew my mind to look at it because here you have people, you know, peasants in the countryside, you've got poor people who live in the shanty towns who have risen up, made revolution and begun to change the face of Peruvian society because in large parts of the Peruvian countryside, it ain't the case anymore that Fujimori runs the show. Mm -hmm. The revolution runs the show. Yeah, they're pretty and they showed right you there. people, you know, going out, you know, to do the collective work on the farmland. They talk with some of these people and you got the sense that these were people just like us, people who had been ripped off, abused and brutalized by some rich person and who got tired of it, united their ranks and rose up and now they were remaking society. And I think that's very important for people to check out because it points to what's possible. You know, and there are a lot of things going on today that point to what's possible. One thing I want to say is that the Revolutionary Worker newspaper, this video that I'm talking about, yeah. the people of the Shining Path, are available at Revolution Books in Manhattan. I think that's Where, where are you on 13th or? Uh, it's 16th Street, 16th 13 Street, yeah, right. East 16th Street. Right, yeah. And people can call it at 691-3345. Uh, that's 691-3345, and they can get this and a lot of other material. Right, okay, good. That we're yeah running out. And of course, and of course, we went to, uh, and, and Malcolm, Malcolm, yeah, I was going to say, on this point of and Malcolm talked about things that are right? inspiring people today, yeah. we think that the, Mal the movie Malcolm X is very important. We've carried a review and several other articles on the movie, uh -huh. you know, and we say straight up like, okay, it's not the movie we would have made. We would have more emphasized Malcolm's opposition to uh, U.S. aggression in Vietnam and other parts of the world. The movie doesn't do enough of that. Yeah. But the movie brings forward Malcolm as somebody who was an uncompromising fighter against the oppression of black people. It shows him going from a life of crime to being a revolutionary leader. And we think that that's very, very important. We think that in the situation that exists today, with the, the conditions that many of the youth are forced into, yeah. their youth is being spent just like Malcolm's youth was spent. Right, 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 and right. Malcolm's life is itself an example to them that if this guy could transform yeah. from what he was into, dealing drugs, hustling, pimping, and all like that, yeah. stealing, that they could transform from what they've been forced into to become part of the solution to the problem. And that solution's got to be revolution. Yeah. So we think that the movie is very important and will have a very important positive impact. We think that, uh, you know, it presents a challenge to people like us because the movie will help people who want to fight back against all this oppression, help to stiffen their backs, you know, and inspire them to fight back. But, you know, we think that we've got to play a role in helping them to learn how to fight and win. Yeah, right. You know, because and that's what we got to do. We can't, we, we need to go beyond Malcolm. Malcolm was a very important revolutionary hero, but, uh, he wasn't able to lead a revolution. Yeah. 
you I know, don't, conditions I don't weren't ripe for it at that yeah. time. Yeah, I things weren't ready. He played a role in helping to ripen them. Right. But we've got to, we owe it to him and we owe it to ourselves to go beyond where he went. And the times really do call for revolution. It's, it's an overworked term very often and lots of, you know what I mean, like the ad agencies have just bastardized it and so forth. So that rather than everybody just being workers or, or extolling workers somehow in a system that's increasingly technology, that they should own the technology. They should well, be asking for no. ownership, which I happen to feel. So it's, a, it's okay. a how do we get it? There's different yeah, paths to Yeah, see, that's the thing. I didn't say that I'm against the transformation of ownership. I'm for a big transformation of ownership but you from the away with property things. of a handful of people to the collective property of all of society. Yeah, I mean, but that's the a big transformation. Yeah, the collective property <laughs> of everyone is in the hands of the ruling uh, yeah. political organization, which would be you. And I'm just saying, look, it might be a little bit better. No, it would be no, or the people who run this uh, us socialist and the stones, millions of people who rose up and made revolution. That's take over and run the country. And I'm just saying, look, why don't we just let everybody have some ownership? I mean, all of these working class people, instead of saying we're working class, let everybody have some ownership of that technology, private ownership, so that they have a way of getting income other than just being workers. As long as we're just going to be workers in an era where technology is what's producing it, we're forever going to be in a difficult situation or we're going to run the risk of having it all, all the political power and all of the economic power in the hands of a few people. Now it's in the hands of some capitalists and if we have a revolution without spreading the ownership of that tech, we don't want to lose the technology, the capability that the yeah, technology Yeah, well, see, I'm not, we're not talking about losing the technology or the, except, or where it plays, except where it plays a uh, backward role anyway because there is some technology I think we could do without. We could do without some of this military technology. Amen. Amen. That exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we also could direct our technology <coughs> in many different ways. I mean we could figure out how to undo some of the damage to the uh, ecosystem that has been done. I mean yeah. we've got the capability to do that too. The problem is that there is no profit in it. You know, oh, well, that's and another we think, aspect of we it. Think, that's yeah. why we think that we've got to make this ability to transform things the collective property of people so it doesn't come down to a handful of people deciding what's in their best interest. Well, okay. See, when I talked about this, trans this revolutionary institutions of power, we ain't talking about the Revolutionary Communist Party and its leaders and that's it, end of story. We're talking about the millions of people who rose up and made revolution and we really mean it when we say that we're, we challenge people to not only be conscious revolutionaries today and not blind followers but even more in the future we got to get ready for the challenge of running a society you know because we don't want people to make a revolution and then say we'll put Bob Avakian or Carl Dix in charge and then trust them to do right because this ain't the kind of thing that somebody can do for you. No, because it's emancipation a big it's a big, is it's a, a self. It's a big system and that would be a mess. That would be too much of a mess and the human condition would suffer tremendously under that and the people would suffer the most of the people who are suffering already. But in one thing we're certainly agreed is that the world has to change and has to change qualitatively. There has to be a vision of that kind of change and one important vision of that change is that which has been advanced by you, Bob Avakian, and even, you know, and to the people who are behind the revolutionary worker, people are encouraged to get in touch with that, get in touch with the bookstore, get in touch with that. See Malcolm. Malcolm is a movie that we all should see. Begin to get in touch with the basic injustice which exists within the system uh, as it has evolved and which has to change. It's just that some, there are some differences as how that change might go about. But it's been a pleasure talking with you. We've run out of time. Yeah, I'm really here. sorry. The hour goes quick. It does. It does <laughs> go fast. And it's been your pleasure to have the perceptions in of, um, Kyle Dix, uh, national chairperson for the national Board, spokesperson. Sorry, national spokesperson for the Revolutionary Worker Communist Workers Party. Happy to be able to share those with you, and we invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming. Back. <laughs>